Hey guys, we're Neurotech Santa Cruz, and we're building a synthetic telepathy project using subvocal recognition. So AI voice assistants have developed really quickly in the past few years, and they have great cap capabilities, but they're still unable to provide a really effective user experience. Um, this is partly due to social restrictions on speaking out in public um, and vocal misunderstandings that come up from time to time. Um, so we're going about this by using subvocal recognition. Um, Subvocalization is a process by which your brain causes really subtle activations in your mo in your vocal muscles when you're thinking, and then we can actually use EMG to measure those muscle activations and deep learning models to recognize the word that you're reading or thinking. Um, so using this kind of subvocal recognition paradigm, we can go about enabling synthetic telepathy and accelerating the merger between AI and humans, as Elon Musk would like to say. So now we have a quick demo on this from Phoebe. Our headset does look a bit cyberpunk, but these components are all necessary for stable, reproducible recordings. And here's some of our hardware that we'll discuss later on. After starting the web app, Phoebe gets prompted with some questions that she can sub-vocalize in response to. These are just yes or no questions because right now our model is trained for that binary classification, um, but our app also allows her to tell us whether that was an accurate sub-vocalization prediction or not. Um, so she doesn't have a twin, and she finds that that was indeed an accurate sub-vocalization recognition. Um, so each time she has to click that start time button because we want to get a more accurate time window frame. And after she clicks that, the hardware just records the data and then passes it through the data processing and machine learning pipelines. Awesome. So now let's take a look at the details of hardware team's technology. Hi, I'm Sabrina from the hardware team. And so the hardware team is in charge of two main processes, which are is taking recordings and 3D headset design. The materials we use were the Cytom board and the USB dongle, which are used to connect to the computer, nine gold plate electrodes, which are divided into seven measurement electrodes and one bias and one reference electrode, and a 1020 conductive paste, which is used to attach the electrodes to the face. The samples were taken with the open PCI GUI and Rainbow. The 3D headset design was modeled using the Diffusion 360. It features a housing for the electrodes, battery pack, and board. We also included a copper wire skeleton to the headset in order to provide structure for the electrode wires. Velcro was used to secure the battery and board enclosures to the bicep and the headset to the head. We also used glue to attach the copper wires and loops to the headset. And so here are the results. We have 50 minutes of recorded data in total, and we have a 3D printed headset with EMG electrodes. Cool. So now let's take a look at the data team, which actually processed the data that hardware recorded. Yeah, hi, I'm Sadil from the data team. So initially, the data pipeline was set up after understanding what kind of data we'd be getting from the hardware and how we could uh, maximize the accuracy in the ML model. The pipeline framework we built up was as follows. First, when you uh, receive the two-minute recording from the hardware, we splice them up into 60 chunks of two seconds. Then each individual uh, chunk will have uh, will go through a, a fourth-order Butterworth filter. And we would use the independent component analysis provided by the many tools um, and, and many tools API. And then afterwards, at the very end, we wouldn't scale it down using normalization. Then we would export all these chunks into a PKL file and send it to the ML team for them to test it out. When we were actually testing what, how, what impacts our techniques were making on the data, we realized that AC, uh, ICA was making minimal impact on the entire data, so we removed it. And then afterwards, we realized that, uh, that standardization is a normalization uh, scaling technique yielded more accuracy. So like you can see here on the two graphs, uh, the raw data on, on the left and the uh, filter data on the right, how the filter data actually spoots the raw data out. And then like I stated before, the after replacing normalization standardization, our accuracy shot up to 80 to 85% from 70%. And the work on increasing the accuracy continues. Cool, so now let's take a look at machine learning team from Jessalyn. I'm Jessalyn from the machine learning team and our, um, purpose was to build a model based on the data that the data team passed to us. And our model was a classification model. It's based on the EEGNet paper and the architecture is as follows. It has three convolution layers, a temporal convolution, a depth-wise convolution, and a separable convolution. And then it goes into a linear, linear layer into a sigmoid function. Um, the reason why we use the EEGNet paper is because it has fewer parameters to fit and the 
tables show that it performed just as well as generalized models. Uh, it performs better than generalized models and just as well as um, specified um, convolution models. The libraries we used were PyTorch, Scikit, and NumPy. And although the, the model architecture was heavily based on the EGNet papers, the hyperparameters were tuned to fit uh, EMG data. Uh, the results. We reached up to 90% train test accuracy on single participant binary classification. And this is a graph um, that's showing our accuracy. And um, in the future, we will move, um, we will continue to train our model to try to improve the accuracy. Um, and Awesome. So now let's take a look at the UI team, which actually used those machine learning models in production. Conrad? Hi, I'm Conrad, the UI team representative. Um, our goal here was to display the output of the uh, ML model and provide a simple user experience. So we began with that by building um, UI with React and Flask. And um, once our basic functionalities were set up, uh, we integrated our work with the ML data and hardware teams. And we were then able to send the data to be displayed on the front end from the Flask server. So um, some functionalities we had were the ability to move between questions. So uh, as you can see, it's like next question. And then you can also go to the data tab and then view the previous questions, as well as um, uh, we set up a database to store the accuracy and uh, predictions for future use for the ML team. Um, after each question, it's uh, entered into the database. And then um, we also have a port number input for others, other users to connect their headset. And um, yeah, so as you can see, we also accomplished our goal of simple user experience as um, our user testing uh, yielded positive results. And yeah. <laughs> cool. Great, so now let's just take a couple minutes for each team rep to go over the lessons they've learned working with their own teams. Hardware? Yeah, so the hardware team faced some limitations um, due to securing one device and it slowed down the amount of recordings that we could get because there would only be one device producing recordings. As for the data team, and when the school year started, the productivity level of all the of all the team members dropped. So we had a few team bonding sessions, which actually helped uh, increase the productivity for us overall. For the ML team, the ML team members were fairly inexperienced, and um, we learned a lot. And we learned that it is important to have um, good knowledge and experience before creating a model. Yeah, the UI team had a similar um, lessons as the other teams. Um, we also noted that uh, testing with hardware and getting the integrations done as early as, as possible is important to allow for us to uh, start incorporating additional features for uh, future projects. Cool. Now Kate is going to cover some future work and, and new possibilities of our technology. Definitely. We're really excited to continue working and developing our project. So potential use cases that we could already apply our project to include communicating with disabled or trauma victims who are too shocked to speak. Uh, also doing simple card games that require discrete communication like poker and doing polygraph or lie tests that can be measured with some vocal recognition for more accurate classification of whether or not a person is telling the truth. We also plan to train the model on continuous data rather than uh, recordings of fixed window sizes and having a rolling window might improve the classification of words continuously as opposed to uh, in a fixed frame. We also plan to do phonetic recognition uh, that will allow us to better interface with AI and uh, assistance on mobile or desktop. Neurotech SC was started in March of this year during the COVID-19 pandemic. So the extent of all our communication has been over Slack and Zoom. However, we were still able to develop and test a hardware project virtually uh, with over 20 members. As a first year club, we were able to make a substantial first step and we look forward to evolving as a club by building more projects and also making contributions in research. Yeah, it's been really great working with all the team reps and I'm sure the team reps all enjoyed their teams as well. And we think we made a pretty cool project and look forward to continuing work on it in the next few months. Um, thank you, that's about it.